Buonasera a tutti. This is very strong. Very. Um, buonasera a tutti. I think, as I look around the room, I think everybody knows me. Uh, I'm the director of this program, which is called the Briar Center for Overseas Studies in Florence, and I have the pleasure tonight of introducing uh, Professor Hazel Marcus. Uh, if you were here last week, you uh, heard me uh, mention her name when Professor Paula Moya gave her talk. Professor Marcus Moya and Sol Deaver are here on site for the entire spring quarter, and they're co teaching uh, two classes one called Growing Up American, Growing Up Italian, and another one which is focused on the gardens of Florence, and they're just back every Wednesday afternoon, they're just back from a trip to yet another. A wonderful um, Florentine or Tuscan garden. Let me uh, uh, share with you uh, uh, a few uh, a few information. You know, a few pieces of information. There are very many, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to touch upon a few of them um, uh, to uh, introduce Professor Marcus this afternoon. Hazel Marcus is a leading social psychologist, and she's a pioneer in cultural psychology as well. She's a Davis Brock professor in uh, behavioral sciences at Stanford University. In her area of specialization, Professor Marcus studies how culture, race, ethnicity, social class, and gender make and mirror the self, notion of identity, cognition, uh, uh, motivation, and emotion. She is the faculty director of Stanford SPAR. This is one of the many wonderful acronyms that we have at Stanford. It stands for the social, psycholo social psychological answers to real world questions. You have it up there um, on the screen. She's also the uh, founder and former director of Stanford's Research Institute for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. She's also the co-director of Stanford's Mind, Culture, and Society Lab. In addition to all of this, Professor Marcus is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she's a recipient, she's a recipient of the American Psychological Association Award for Distinguished uh, Scientific Contribution. She authored more than 200 research articles and she has received funding from the National Science Foundation, from the NIH, and many other uh, 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 sources. Her uh, work has been mentioned and discussed on a number of media outlets. Um, uh, so the ones that have featured her work include the New York Times, uh, the Los Angeles Times, uh, the Japan Times, the Boston Globe, Self, Vogue, CNN, and CBS. Her recent publications include Doing Grace, 21 Essays for the 21st Century. Century. This is a book that she co-edited with Professor Moya. She also co-authored uh, a, a, a book called Face, Facing Social Class, The Role of Societal Rank in Social Interactions. And she wrote, she co-authored yet another book called Clash, How to Thrive in the Multicultural World which is the title of our talk tonight. Um, I'm most pleased that uh, Professor Mark has accepted our invitation to uh, give a talk for us as part of our lecture series, Incontri a Palazzo. Thank you very much. Thank you, grazie Linda, for that lovely introduction. It's, it's a true pleasure to be here and really to be among people like yourself and Anna Alessio and Fosca, Giovanni, everybody who's making it such a terrific experience for us and also all of you are such great cultural informants, ambassadors for the Italian culture. We just, as you said, came back from the garden class and the garden class today went to the Villa Medici of Fiesoli and I'm just overcome with um, how beautiful it was and how those Medici's knew how to live. Um, I want to talk today about my work, which has been in the area, as you said, of cultural psychology. And really the main point of what I want to say today is that our minds are shaped by culture. Or another way to say this is that the psychological is cultural. And we know as about cultures, we know that we have 
interesting differences in, in how we eat to how we dress and how we worship, how we play sports. But that's not all. The point of cultural psychology is that our ways of thinking, feeling, acting, our psyches are influenced, continually influenced by our various cultural contexts. And we all are part of many cultural contexts. We are um, all multicultural. And we know this to be the case because of many, many now, a few decades of behavioral studies and surveys and analyses of cultural products that um, reveal to us these differences. And so I want to share some of that today. I think it's important to do this because as we begin to fully understand the ways in which we are culturally shaped, we and how our cultures are influencing us, we can, and this is the hope, um, do much more to reduce conflict among cultures and to foster intercultural inter understanding. I think that more knowledge is absolutely the one powerful route to intercultural understanding. So what I want to do today is give you some examples of what I'm talking about, and then I hope we can have some time about discussion because it's been very fun for me to think about Italian culture. There's not a lot of work comparing Italians to Americans or even Italians to other Europeans, but I've got a lot of ideas about it, and I'm not afraid to speculate, so it would be fun to have some discussion. One tool for understanding cultural difference, and the one I'm going to talk about today, um, is to ask yourself about a given cultural context. What is emphasized in this cultural context? Is it the independence of the self from others, or is it the interdependence of the self with others, or the interdependence that connects the self with others? That turns out to be a useful distinction that helps us make some classifications among cultures, and I'm going to tell you more about this. But first, before I start, I have a little quiz for you. We've been taking Italian um, since we've been here, and our professor, um, Fiorenza, I've noticed that whenever she gives a quiz, the audience really pays attention, the class really pays attention. Well, what's a little different about the quiz I'm going to give you than the ones for Fiorenza gives is that there's no right answers, so don't, don't be nervous. Okay. Your house is on fire. I'm sorry. <laughs> Inside, your mother is asleep in one bedroom, and your spouse is asleep in another bedroom. You have time to rescue only one of them. Okay, think about it. Whom would you save? On a show of hands, it's a quiz, I told you. Let me see a show of hands for those of you who would save your mother. Your mother. Let me see. <laughs> okay. It's pretty interesting. I'll only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, I've got a little twelve. Help twelve for the mother. How many would say the spouse? Where did you spouse? I think I should count. As a good researcher. As a good researcher, I don't think I should count these two married couple up here, but <laughs> okay. So this is um, all right. So remember what the answer. Let me see how many would save your spouse again. I got to see that. So mom wins in this crowd, this kind of odd crowd here in the Breyer Center. Okay, got another quiz for you. Five pens. You get to choose one, and you get to keep this pen. Four are the same color. Orange, one is a different color, green. Let me see a show of hands for those of you who would cheat their otherwise equal the same. They write very well. How many would choose the orange pen? <coughs> Four of you. Five of you. Okay. All right. Now let me see a show of hands for how many of you would choose the green pen? Okay, more. So green pen, green pen wins in this case. Okay. So hold on to that for a little bit, and let me tell you a couple of other stories to um, uh, talk about how I got very interested in cultural psychology. Um, it actually came from the students that I was teaching in my classes, which uh, Stanford is a very diverse campus. It's 53% uh, students of color, and these students are from everywhere in the U.S. And, and in the world. And what I found is that as Stanford was getting increasingly diverse, many of my techniques for motivating students and getting them to be interested in the classroom were basically falling on pretty deaf ears. A lot of things worked working as they had worked um, before as the campus became more and more diverse. 
And in particular, I had one student, Hee Jung Kim. She was um, from Korea, and she was in a, a graduate seminar that I was teaching. And like most professors I, in a seminar, expect all the students to contribute. And I would call on Hee Jung and I'd ask her a specific question, and she would just look at her hands on the desk. Or I would say, he jumped, next week I'm going to ask you about this. So she would be prepared, warm calling instead of cold calling. And she just um, didn't have anything to contribute to the class. And it was at that point that I noticed on her email signature, it said this. The empty carriage. Oh, I got the wrong one, sorry. Oh, sorry, thanks Paul. <laughs> the empty carriage rattles the loudest. Mm. Does anyone know what that means? Somebody want to tell me what it means? Yes, Helen? I mean, like, you make the most noise if there isn't anything. So, the empty carriage, like, someone doesn't know anything, you make the most noise. Sometimes those who know the least have the most to say. And it's a very well-known oh, Korean uh-huh. proverb. And um, he, as I got to know Hee Jung, she went on to explain to me that talking and thinking are not the same activity in Korea, in the East, as they are in the West, in, in Europe, and in North America. We think that good talking fosters good thinking, good thinking fosters good um, talking. They, they really are of a piece. And as I got to know Hee Jung better, I, I found out that she grew up in classrooms that looked a lot like this, where the goal of the student is to sit calmly and have a very quiet mind, pay close attention to what the teacher is saying, so and to try to adjust your own thinking to what the teacher, who is the expert, who knows the most, is saying. Um, there is a time for questions, but it's after you absorb the material that the teacher has to, um, has to offer. Now, at the same time, when I was upset with Hee for not contributing, and I was accusing her of being a, a, a free writer in the class, not sharing her ideas, it became clear to me that most of the other students in, in the class had a very different background. They'd grown up in classrooms that looked more like this. Mm-hmm. And these are classrooms where the students often, from the background of most of my European American students, students were you know, almost competing with each other to get their hand in the air, to offer their unique ideas about particular points of view. They wanted to freely express their thoughts. They maybe even wanted to inter- um, influence the other, the teacher's way of thinking. And this is a very, um, many classrooms look like this in, in the U.S. Do I have to talk in this? Is that okay? I do? Oh, okay. I will do it then. It's just kind of loud feedback. I will know if it's better. Now, these differences between classrooms are just not differences between class- classrooms. They reflect lots of underlying ideas that are that are um, part of the culture. Here's just two, for example. Oh, no. I'm going too fast. Sorry. In the West, we say, what do we say? The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? I mean, if you have something, something's going on, you're thinking something, feeling something, you better tell me. In Asia, throughout Asia, actually, they say that duck that squawks the loudest gets shot. Mm. Or sometimes they say the tall poppy gets sheared off. Mm. Or they say the nail that stands out gets pounded down. And this is an idea that actually standing out and making a scene about yourself, American style, Middle class American style can be good because people know what you're thinking, you can have an influence on your world, but at the same time, it makes you vulnerable when you stand out. You're separate from others, you're pulled apart from your group. It might not always be the safest place to be, and so you really want to think twice about whether you want to put yourself in that position or not. So it's a different type of cultural wisdom that's there, which has a lot of um, underlying historical, philosophical precedent that I'll talk a little bit about in the morning, in, in later. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> I'm going to keep you here till the morning. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. Um, so let me tell you about things a little bit. Let me then tell you. So that was Hee Jung. And what was interesting about Hee Jung is that she got so annoyed with everybody telling her, come on, talk out, talk out. And nobody seemed to understand about the difference between talking and thinking. And when she was thinking, she wasn't prepared to talk and she didn't see why she had to. That she went on to do a brilliant dissertation. Many, many studies in a, in a lovely package that shows that talking and thinking indeed do go together for 
European American students, American students with European background, or, uh, but for Asian Americans, Korean Americans, Japanese Americans, um, Taiwanese Americans, many people that we had in our studies, that talking gets in the way of thinking. And she showed that um, very, very powerfully. And so this now has been an interesting point for lots of professors who have many Asian students in their classrooms, as we do, to think about what is the what is the best way to build a classroom environment so everybody can feel um, that they are contributing. Let me tell you about another student I had at the same time in the same seminar, and her name was Elena Connor, and she was from somewhere that was a little less far away than Seoul. South Korea. She was from the south of the United States, from Memphis. She grew up in a poor community. Um, her uh, mom was um, a single mom and was um, really struggling to bring her up. And Elena did not leave the south, did not leave Memphis, Tennessee, until a teacher encouraged her to apply to Yale. Yale gave her a scholarship, and she decided to go go north to the land of the of the Yankees. Um, to go to um, to go to s school, and when she got there, it, she couldn't believe the way everybody else was. These students seemed to have no end of opinions and ideas and things to say, and they were talking in full paragraphs. And you know, she she had she just didn't she wasn't um, didn't feel comfortable in that. And she um, I'll show you a picture of her. Oh, I wanted to tell you the main thing that we know about Memphis, Tennessee, I wanted to tell that for the Italians was it's where Elvis Presley lived. And she went from um, Memphis to Yale. And that's a picture. This is Elena in a flower dress. So she was leaving. I show a picture. Okay, because, so we're not seeing it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not, it's not it. Um, she, uh, she actually is the co-author of the book that I'm going to tell you some about. And when she left to go to Yale, her grandmother gave her this sign to hang in her dorm room, which was better to remain silent, be thoughtful, than to speak out or remove all doubt. <laughs> and so you can see that when she got to Yale, it was, she couldn't understand why you know all these people were talking all the time. They had no end of ideas. They had no um, hesitancy sharing them. What was she? What was she supposed to do? And she thought um, much more like each other that she should wait till she knew more to express herself. Now these are two very um, different students in many ways. They had many different um, cultures that were influencing both of them. But in fact, they had some things um, in common. And what they had in common is both Elena and Heejung were using their interdependent selves. And I think what Elena's grandmother wanted her to do, and probably Heejung's grandmother in Korea wanted her to do, and thought was the good and the right thing to do, was to use their interdependent selves. Now, all of us have an interdependent self. The interdependent self is the one that puts relationships first. It's a self that wants to be similar and close and connected with others, wants to fit in with others, seeks to try to adjust one's behavior to others, and is very happy being rooted in tradition, in history, and in place. And you can see as the diagram shows here, the self is in the middle, the middle circle, and the other circles around the edge are other people. As humans, other people are very critical always in every setting, but it's the nature of the relationship with other people in your setting that can vary um, by culture. And so this self here, the interdependent self, is a self with a porous boundary, and the self is defined by relationships with other people. Now, the kind of self that I wanted Heejung to have, and the kind of self that Yale University wanted Elena to have, is what we call an independent self. This is a self, you can see the diagram's fairly similar, but the boundary is not porous. And the independent self is focused on the individual rather than on the relational. It's focused on being unique rather than similar, focused on influencing others rather than adjusting oneself to others, and wants to be free from tradition, place, and history as much as possible rather than rooted in them. And what's different about the independent self here, shown on the, on the right, is that what drives the self is what's inside the self, which is 
goals and motives and attitudes and um, various other attributes. Uh, that's the, these are two ways of thinking about the self, two ways of construing the self. And both of these ways of thinking about the self are necessary for us. We all have both of these selves. We need them to get through the day. We need them to get through our lives. But the point is, um, most of the time, one of these selves is more elaborated than another self. And different cultural contexts that, well, that we are all part of tend to emphasize one way of being a self versus another way of being a self. Okay, so I'm now going to show you two cultural products. I said at the beginning that many of our studies have to do with analyzing various cultural products as a way of getting evidence for these kinds of differences. These cultural products are two American car commercials, and they're both recent commercials for fuel-efficient cars. They're very similar, but they're different in some other ways that I think will quickly illuminate what I'm talking about as far as the difference between an independent and interdependent self goes. So let me play the first one. This is for a commercial for um, Cadillac. Why do we work so hard? For what? For this? For stuff? Other countries, they work, they stroll home, they stop by the cafe, they take August off. Off. Why are you like that? Why are we like that? Because we're crazy, driven, hard-working believers, that's why. Those other countries think we're nuts, whatever. With the Wright brothers insane, Bill Gates, Les Paul, Ali. Were we nuts when we pointed to the moon? That's right. We went up there, you know what we got? Bored. So we left. <laughs> got a car up there, left the keys in it, you know why? Good math. <laughs> it's we're funny. the only ones going back up there, that's why. <laughs> but I digress. It's pretty simple. You work hard, you create your own luck, and you've got to believe anything is possible. As for all the stuff, that's the upside of only taking two weeks off in August. Miss Pump. So you see, this is this is Cadillac trying to draw on those people that might um, buy a BMW or some other sort of luxury car. But you see, it was the central figure. He is surrounded by family. We all have families and all have relationships. But I hope you notice the types of relationships that were um, shown in, in that particular ad. Now let me show you another one. This is for um, uh, a different car, which you will see here. We're not single models. We're trying our best to be role models. We don't jump at the sound of the opening bell. Because we're trying to make the school better. Quarter booth beats quarter office any day. possible, you just go out and get it, right? You make some goals, you plan ahead, and then you, 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 you do it. You change the world. So that's the independent self. The interdependent self is one that's very aware of how important it is to fit in with one's relationships and to be connected with other people. And what's interesting is, I, I think it's important, is that to recognize that we can all identify with both of these selves and we understand these differences. But what often happens in a lot of cultural conflicts is that people do not see this clash between independence and interdependence. And when we don't see that, 
there can often be a great deal of cultural misunderstanding. Now, I'm not arguing that this difference between independence and interdependence is the only thing that's at play in cultural misunderstandings and cultural conflicts, but it is one tool to give you some insight into many of the differences that are afoot today. And this comes from the uh, book, the recent book that Linda uh, uh, talked about when she introduced me. It's a book I've written with my colleague, the one I showed you, the picture of her in her flower dress. She doesn't wear that dress anymore. She's a lot, she's a lot older. Um, but this is Helena Connor, and we um, wrote this, this book. And what we tried to do in the book was suggest that the clash of independence and interdependence drives a lot of conflicts. We tried to show how cultures foster either independence or interdependence, and that's what I want to talk about today to show you that. And, and then suggest how resolving some of these tensions between the two or making way for both independence and interdependent ways of being within our various settings can foster intercultural understanding and get more productivity and more creativity from, from everyone. Now, in the book, we talked about eight major cultural clashes, and here they are, each row indicates a different cultural clash that we talked about. You might say, why did we pick those? We picked those because there was sufficient research to make the case in, uh, for this clash. There are many other um, cultural clashes that we want to talk about, but there's really not a lot of research about them yet. So you can see, we talked about the difference between the East and the West, and most of those studies have to do with North American studies versus East Asian studies. We talked about the clash between um, men and women. We talked about the clash between uh, whites and people of color, between the middle class and working class. We talked about the clash between regions. In the U.S., we don't quite have the same sort of regional um, identities quite as strong as you have here in Italy, but they are still quite strong. So people of the coasts have California, the West Coast, the East Coast are different than people who live in the Midwest, the, the heartland, and people who live in the South. So we also have those regional cultures in the U.S. And then we talked about religion, and we talked about workplace cultures. They're very different. And then we talked about the difference between the global North and the global South, which is basically an economic equator, the difference between the haves and the have-nots in the world. And one thing I hope that you would notice here is on the left, those are all in blue. And those are all cultural contexts that tend to foster an independent way of being. Tend to be in all contexts that focus more on the individual and the individual's goals and motives and preferences and expressing those. On the right, those in red, those are cultural contexts that tend to foster, require, emphasize interdependence and connecting with others and paying attention to relationships. So I think if you just go down the rows and try and think about yourself, you can see that most of us are probably a mix of independence and interdependence. But this is one group into trying to look at a culture and think about what's 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 central in this culture. What independence or interdependence? If you can get um, uh, a, a beat on that, then you can understand a, a fair amount, at least initially. And so what I want to do is give you two examples today. I want to talk about um, an east-west set of differences and sort of light that up. And then I want to talk about within the U.S., working class versus middle class. And you can tell me how that um, if that makes any sense from an Italian perspective. I've been really interested to um, uh, think about Italy and to think about it with these, our great cultural ambassadors, and, you know, uh, Linda Fosca and, and Alessio have been um, helping us a lot understand what we're um, finding here. And of course, um, Fiorenzo with not, she doesn't only teach language, she teaches the Italian culture. You know, and it's been, it's been terrific. And what I have here is a quote from Hooper. And Hooper uh, was the um, author of the John Hooper, the book, recent book um, called The Italians. And that was sent to all of the Stanford students. They all got a copy of it. And then um, Paula Moya and I decided to use it for our text. And I think that um, he really, um, has some very valuable insights. He, was, he gave the first in country. And he says, it has often struck me that 
um, Bill Kacharian is starting. Put the next one. Oh. Yes, yes. He writes, uh, he has often struck me, he writes, that Il Pacheri de Stare in Sene is one of the several things that link Italians to the Japanese. And he goes, before this, he says that you know, most people compare the Italians to the French or, or maybe to the Spanish, but he says you've got to pay attention to the Japanese. So that really caught my attention, having studied East Asia a lot. He says, both put a high value on the appearance of things. The Japanese, like the Italians, have a recent history of wielding an economic power that far exceeded their influence on the world stage. Both have a tendency to form anti-competitive cartel-like structures. Italians are accustomed to living cheap by jowl. And he has a lot of other features of the culture that he finds that are similar between um, Italy and Japan. And I thought um, there are very few studies about Italians, very few, you know, um, empirical studies gathering the kind of data I've been talking about to really um, look at these differences and see how Italians compare to Americans or compare to Japanese, but I think it would be um, fascinating to do. And the, this, this phrase, of course, is the, the pleasure or the joy of being together. And certainly people everywhere in every culture experience the importance of being together, usually in their families. But from my own observations so far, and, and, and uh, um, being informed by other writers on Italy, I think there is more emphasis on the pleasure of being together. Um, we certainly saw that as a when we were at the uh, at the at the soccer game this um, this weekend. And so I'd be curious what people are um, thinking about this. So let me um, tell you what um, what. Another important thing that I want to um, say uh, that goes along with this idea about um, we don't really have a lot of data yet, and that is the social science as we know it now, which includes psychology, sociology, economics, political science, is what we now call in the U.S. WEIRD. Mm -hmm. And WEIRD is an acronym for, it is Western, it's about people at places that are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And it's okay that we know a lot about these weird worlds. Um, we know a lot uh, uh, about it, that these worlds are powerful worlds, but in terms of the world's population, people who fit in the weird categorization are about 15% of the world's population. So that means as social scientists, we really are missing an understanding of 85% of the world's population. So we're nowhere near a comprehensive understanding of behavior. And when you're looking at the weird world talking to the rest of the world, the majority world, you have this sort of underlying set of accusations. From the West, particularly from North America, you have a kind of accusation like, the rest of the world, you're lawless, corrupt, inefficient, and immoral. That's the kind of view that often comes from people who are doing economic development from the West, for example. You're like, what's wrong with the rest of the people in the world? Why can't they get it together and act like people in the West? And from the rest of the world, the majority world, comes the answer that's something like, well, why would we want to do it your way anyway? You're selfish, disloyal, cold, and immoral. That's more or less what the, what the answer is. This is sort of the debate, and, and they're slowly beginning to have, uh, be an understanding in the West, and particularly in North America, that there are multiple good ways to be, or at least more than one. There's more than one right answer to what's good, true, beautiful, and efficient in the world. And if we're going to fit our worlds into one world, we really have to understand these different ways. And of course, these differences, I don't think I have to say it, but they're not biological, they're not inherent. These differences we see among people, they are, of course, cultural, because we are people shaped by our cultures. If I want to uh, give a definition for culture, I usually give this one, which is the ideas, institutions, and interactions that guide the thoughts, feelings, and actions of individuals, so four eyes as a way to remember it. And these four um, eyes uh, fit together 
in a dynamic that we call the culture cycle. And first you can see on the left-hand side of the culture cycle, we talk about individual thoughts, feelings, and actions, the kinds of things that I just had you raise your hand to. The next layer of the culture cycle includes our daily interactions with social norms and networks and various kinds of cultural artifacts, like those ads I showed you, all of which are shaping our thoughts and our feelings and, and our actions. The next layer up of the culture cycle are institutions, which are those entities that write down and, and formalize the rules of society. They include government, religions, legal, economic, educational, scientific institutions. These institutions are very important. They make some things possible. They forbid others by law. And of course, the, the last layer that's really important of the cultural cycle is those deep-seated, long-standing, but often unspoken ideas about what's good, right, and natural. Ideas about what's the right way to be a self. Ideas about what it means to be a man or a woman. Ideas about who belongs at the university and who doesn't. These sorts of ideas that people don't really speak, but they undergird our cultures. So let me talk about the culture cycle with respect to East versus West. The point I want to make that you can probably see from the overall chart is that East Asian culture cycles tend to foster interdependence and European culture cycles tend to foster independence. That's why we got the clash, the kind of clash that we get in the classrooms at Stanford, for example, with many Asian students, many instructors and students who are from um, different culture cycles. Let me uh, start first at the individual level here. Now, I asked you about this, which pen would you choose? And what I can tell you is this study has been done numerous times, and it's very clear that people with uh, Americans or Europeans tend to say green. They tend to pick the pen that's unique, the one that's different, the one that stands out from the others. And that was certainly the um, clear tendency in this room for people to want the one that's a bit separate from the others, not like the others. A bit different. It's one way that you can express your own unique preferences is by di is and to show you're doing it is by choosing something that other people don't choose. Um, let me look, let me show you now. Um, that was sort of one type of data that you could ask people to do some little behavioral interaction and look at how they differ. Um, although the um, European Americans tend to choose the green pen across the board, Asians. Um, East Asians, uh, Korean Americans, Chinese Americans, Taiwanese Americans, as well as Japanese Americans, almost always choose the one that is common, the common color pen. Without a doubt, people want that pen. They want the one that other people will have. It's a clear way of fitting in, being part of what's going on. Having the green pen from an East Asian perspective makes you vulnerable. It's, it makes you stand out until you know, you know, why am I choosing this pen? It's better to choose the one that everyone else has. Very clear pattern. I don't know what would happen if we had Italians um, do this. I think it's something that we should try. Let me show you another kind of data from the individual level of the culture cycle. These are um, self-descriptions uh, from Stanford University students, and I just have two here. And you can um, look at them quickly to see um, Stanford University students tend to lead with their independent self, and you see this because their self is de defined in terms of very many adjectives. I'm exceptionally optimistic, I have to push myself to do the best I can, I like to live life with a lot of positive energy, I have a taste for the unique, I'm very friendly, I'm very self-confident, it sounds to Stanford students, I know you recognize yourself there. Um, you tend to um, describe yourself in positive attributes, and, and sometimes you'll say something a little negative at the end. When I'm down, it's usually because of stress, something like that. So it's, you know, but there's a particular narrative to describing yourself, and in the Stanford context, which is a Western, European, American, middle class context, people tend to more or less describe themselves as independent self. If you compare Stanford students with students from Kyoto University in Japan, which is very comparable as a university in terms of its prestige and its uh, selectivity, you see that students say somewhat different things. I behave in order for people to feel peaceful. Now, I think probably most of us probably don't want other people to feel unhappy, but mo 
most of us in the Stanford context wouldn't write that. Um, here's another person that says, even if I have displeasure, I compromise myself to the people around me with, without getting rid of the displeasure. So I, I go along, I fit in, I adjust my thinking, I um, don't express my own feelings. Or this person says, I try to have a harmless life. I calm down by being the same as others. I submit that it's not a very Stanford way of being to have a harmless life. Stanford students and our Stanford culture, and we'll talk about that in a minute, encourages us to get out there and change the world, to be a mover and shaker, to make things different, not particularly to be calm or, or to fit in. But that's because the culture is fostering one way of being. Um, Kyoto culture fosters a different way. Now, if you uh, look again at the culture cycle, I'll just give you another example of some of these underlying ideas, philosophically determined historically, ideas with great historical precedent that underlie the kinds of ideas I showed you before. Why do we say that uh, um, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease? Well, in the American context, when you, if you're looking for the philosophical context for uh, the, the the United States, you um, can a good place to start is with Descartes, and he gave a very clear definition of what it means to be a person. Right? He said, "I think, therefore I am." It's my thoughts are who I am that defines me. If you move to the Asian context and look at what Confucius had to say, he said, "Filial piety is the root of all virtue. The most important thing about being a person is honoring one's parents. Why?" One's parents gave you life. Without your parents, there, there would be no you. So your first duty is always to your parents at the beginning and, and throughout life. And in fact, when we give the quiz that I gave you at the beginning, that who would you say in the burning house, your mother or your spouse, was interesting in this room that most of you said your mother, hmm. not, not your spouse. And that was exactly the data that you get in Asian context. Um, without a doubt, um, East Asians say, save, save the mother. Um, you could always get another spouse. You don't get another mother. And of course, the <laughs> Americans most often say um, the, the spouse, because of the spouse, is what? The spouse is reflection of their choice. Mm -hmm. It's like choosing that green, unique pen. Mm -hmm. They chose this person. It was based on their own preferences. So it's the most valuable thing, the most important thing. And you know, that's a pretty big um, difference in behavior. Once you start to unpack it, you can understand what that's about, and you can actually see that both have a lot of logic to them, both saving the mother and the, and the spouse. Um, so these are sort of different ideas that foster this, this different behavior that I'm talking about. If we move to the interaction level, um, at, the, um, at the interaction level, we're talking about uh, how we interact with other people, how we interact with lots of cultural products and artifacts. One of my favorites that I like to show for this difference between East and West is the fairy tales. Now, fairy tales are pretty common around the world, the general outline of them. But once you start to analyze them, what you find out is they aren't identical. So here's the Goldilocks story. In the West, Goldilocks enters the bear's empty home. She samples their porridge and breaks their furniture. And then when she's caught, she flees. At least that was the one I read to my daughter. In the, in the East, the Japanese version, Goldilocks apologizes to the bears when they show up. They accept her apology and they invite her to come again. Why? Because they have a clear understanding of the interdependent reality of the world. You are connected, first and foremost, always to other people. Now, in the United States, we're very mobile. You know, once you've done something like ruin the bear's house, you just like move across the country and nobody will know that. <laughs> or before internet, it used to be that way. But you know, in Japan, you don't move. I think it's true in Italy, too. You stay where you are. You stay in your city. You stay in your family. If you did something like this, it, it, would, be, it would be known. It's not so easy. So an awareness of one's interdependent self, an emphasis on interdependent self um, uh, can help explain some of these differences. At the um, institutional level, uh, we can look at the media, for example, for differences. When you look between 
um, east and west. You see, in the west, you see many ads like this, like the first Cadillac commercial I showed you. This is from magazine advertisements. This is an advertisement for baby food. It says, a good source of iron, zinc, and independence. Now, you know, what sense does that make? But nevertheless, independence is good in the U.S. And you see this little child pulling away from his mother there. This is a Chinese ad. This little girl is not pulling away. She's safely ensconced in the, in the hands of someone that looks like a teacher there, probably, in the arms of a teacher. And they're both fitting in together, looking at their, at their watches, um, being in harmony. So that's a, an example of the culture cycle fostering some of these differences. Why you would choose something unique from an American context? Why you would be likely to say I would save my spouse? Um, it can explain many other differences as well. I want to give you another example now. I'll quickly go through an example from the within the American context. The difference between middle class and working class context, because it also reflects this difference between independence and interdependence. Um, in the U.S., we are mostly a working class nation. Often class these days is defined by whether or not you have a college education. In the U.S., 30% of people in the U.S. have a college, four-year college degree. 70% um, have less than a four-year college degree. That's a, a, Italy is about the same. I just looked it up. It's around 26 to percent of people have a college education, so it's, it's not too different. Um, in the U.S., middle class culture cycles emphasize independence and being an independent self. Working class culture cycles are much more likely to emphasize interdependence. At the ideas level, if we go through the culture cycle again, in the working class context, there's very clear emphasis on being part of a like-minded group, a family, a team, a community that's it's very strong. In the middle class, there's much more emphasis on achievement by the individual, what this individual has done, what this individual has accomplished. Happiness in uh, the middle class context of find my college education really depends on individual success. If you um, look for various types of data, like self-description, you can see um, some uh, very clear differences. This is a description of my high school educated man. What matters, he says, talking about himself and his future, is endurance, not giving up, just being there, sticking with your friends, when the going is not so good, hanging tough. This is a very common sentiment in the working class context. Here's a self-description from somebody with a college education. I think I have a lot of energy. I think I'm well organized. I think I'm smart. I don't think I'm brilliant, but I think I learn quickly. Not very physically inclined. I think I'm kind of hot-headed and stubborn. So, you know, a few negative things, but mostly positive, like the Stanford students. You see that there's a focus on positive attributes about the self. And when you compare working class um, people in working class context with people in middle class context, you see in the middle class context, people are much more likely to focus on these attributes of the self. In the working class, they'll talk about their relationships um, with others. Let me show you a different kind of study. This was one in which we asked people to consider this situation. Consider the situation that you just bought yourself a new car, a very Stanford kind of car, a red Prius, Paula has one. And you take it out and you show it to your friend and you find out the next day that your friend bought the very same car. Okay, let me see a show of hands. Who feels bad? Four, five, four, five people, six people feel bad. Okay, put your hands down. Who feels good? This is, this is, so, this is, this is fitting my... All right, so what we find is the middle class man, I think, sounds like how Linda feels. I'd be disappointed because I wanted to be unique. It spoils my fun and my point of differentiation. The car is very important to one's identity in the middle class context. In the working class context, the man says, I think it's cool. I'd be on, yeah, let's start a car club. And I think, to me, I think this is more Italian from what I've um, observed. You know, there's some emphasis of it more overall. But of course, as I said, you know, all of us have many cultural influences on us. 
And indeed, um, working class are much more likely to say they would not be bothered and that they would feel happy if someone chose the same car. Now what about at the very important interaction level? What's going on every day in these different spaces of working class or middle class that might help explain some of these um, differences that we see? Some of the obvious things are that in working class context, people without college degrees earn less money. I think that's maybe less true in Italy. I've been reading that it's actually easier to get a job in Italy without a college education in, in some respects. In the US, that's not true these days. Um, in, middle, in working class context, people earn less money. They rely more on their family and friends. They move less. They tend to just um, grow up, go to school, start working where they've always been, where their family is. That also strikes me as much more Italian. Um, Americans tend to, tend to move. They tend to move if they've had college education. They tend to work jobs with less choice and control. They're more likely in the working class to teach their kids to fit in, to observe hierarchy, follow tradition. Parents in working class contexts do what parents everywhere do. They want to prepare their kids for the worlds that they will be part of. So they tend to um, focus on observing the rules fitting in, which is if you're going to have a production job or a factory job, it's probably the right kind of self to have. And of course, in working class contexts, you have fewer choices among fewer and less attractive options because you have less resources. So we were, in another set of studies, um, we're looking at what kind of um, influence this has for working class people and middle class people on their relationships with others. And we gave people examples like this. Um, Stephen has an uncle who has become increasingly hot-headed at recent family events. He tends to drink too much and has clashed with Stephen on several occasions. A year ago, Stephen got engaged and as his wedding day comes closer, he is unsure that he wants to his uncle to come to the event. What should he do? Okay, let me see a show of hands who think that he should not invite the uncle. No invitation to the uncle. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. Hands down. How many people think the uncle has to come to the wedding? <laughs> okay, it's pretty. It's pretty. It, this is a very interesting group. It's about. It's about split. I'll just show you. Um, one of the examples, but the differences were very clear by social class. <laughs> Work class participants says family is family. Unfortunately, he has to invite his uncle, but it would be good if he could have a conversation about his concerns. Stephen certainly doesn't want his uncle ruining the event, but if he doesn't invite him, there could be bad blood. And I see shaking heads here. Middle class participant, he should not invite his uncle. People aren't important just because they're family. Move on. <laughs> so, so you see, these are two you know, very different answers. And I think if you think about it for a minute, regardless of what your own view is, you can appreciate the other view. You can see that this is another way. This is a focus on interdependence and connection. The, the moving on is a focus on, on individuality and what's good for the individual, and they both make sense. And in fact, when you look overall at the data, you see that in the middle class, we gave them many vignettes like this, not just one. The middle class tend to say that you should break the old relationship and begin a new one when the relationship gets difficult, and the working class are much less likely to say that. Okay, at the institutional level, the last thing I want to talk about to give an example of this of this difference between working class and middle class in the U.S. is to um, talk about educational institution and talk about the way social class um, creates problems in the educational realm in the U.S. This is the data. There's a big social class achievement gap, in which we see that. Continuing generation students mean students whose parents have a college education, and first generation means students whose parents didn't go to college. They're the first in their family to go to college. Even when those first generation students have very good grades, very good scores, what the data show across the nation is those students drop out more, they get lower grades, they don't form connections with professors, they don't form um, uh, friends with other um, people at the university. And so we start to look at what is this about. And what's become clear is our universities, especially our elite universities like Stanford, they have a clear idea of how to be a person, which is be an independent self. They're set up 
for independence and foster, to foster in, independence. If you've come from a working class background and your parents also, uh, have, they have not gone to college, they haven't fostered independence in you, um, you haven't had much experience with it, you're not very familiar with it or practiced with it, you probably, there'll be a, a clash for you. You won't match, at least at first. You can develop an independent self, but at the beginning you won't have one. And let me just show you a few cultural products from Stanford because you probably don't realize how independent Stanford is, how it's built into the bricks, into the environment. Here's the message that comes in the letter. I don't know if you guys remember it when you got your letter accepting you. It still says, for all the times you stayed up late to get it right, practiced, rehearsed, and gave it your all, took a risk, instead of following the easy path, we applaud you. We look forward to the unique and extraordinary contribution we know you will make to the campus. Now, if you come from a family full of PhDs, that's a cool message to get, or a family full of from doctors, or you know, judges or the kinds of families that lots of Stanford students come from. If you come from a family where you're the first person in your family to go to college, you might like it if Stanford would help you just sort of fit in and help you figure out what you should major in and what courses you would take, at least at first. And then you can build up your independent self. And then you can go on and make your unique and extraordinary contribution. But when you're faced with this as a first generation student and you're told, you know, there's so much choice, and you can do whatever you want. It can be bewildering if you haven't yet fostered an independent self. Here's um, from the uh, view for this year. It's also on the website. Stanford's academic enterprise, expressed by its motto, the wind of freedom blows, embodies the pioneering spirit of the American West. Here, high-achieving, risk-taking students come together in a culture known for its intellectual, athletic, and artistic vitality. I mean, once again, that sounds good if you're prepared for it. If you're not prepared for it and nobody's going to help you make a transition from being an interdependent self like he Jung and talked about at the beginning or from Elena, it can really set you back for the first um, couple of years. We did a, uh, a study of elite universities like Stanford, 75 of them, and we found out that most of them, most university administrators, this was provosts and deans, say that the whole point of college is to become an independent and become an independent self. That's fine. I mean, there's, as I said, many good virtues to an independent self. But when we looked at the motives that students brought to the university, what you can see, the red bars are the first generation students, the blue bars the continuing generation, you can see that many first generation students are bringing a lot of interdependent ideas to the university with them. They want to bring honor to their family, they want to be a role model, they want to show others that people like them can do well, they want to give back to their community, help their family after college. Stanford University is not set up to help you fulfill any of those motives. It's, help, it's set up to help you be a special individual. Um, a unique and different individual. And given the professions that you'll probably go on to with your Stanford degree, that makes sense. But we just wondered if we could, through a simple um, change in materials, make some difference. And what we did is take the letter that comes from uh, John Hennessy. It's a letter that looks like this. It goes to students. And it's a very independent letter. This is what the letter says. It says, I'm delighted you have decided to attend Stanford and that you think Stanford is the right place for you. For the next few years, you'll have many opportunities to explore new areas and learn from our superb faculty and from your own personal exploration and individual experiences as a student. So very focused on being a separate, different individual who influenced the world. We took that letter and we tweaked it in an interdependent direction. So it says, we're so glad that you and your family have decided that you should come to Stanford. Over the next two year, few years, together with the Stanford community, you'll be able to learn with your peers and from your peers. So giving students who are first generation the idea that they could use their interdependent self while at Stanford and also be successful. So we did a laboratory study in which they read one letter or another letter, then we gave people a lot of tasks. We told them they were helping us prepare for the next year's incoming class. And I'll just show you one of the kinds of tasks we gave, which was a word puzzle. You have to unscramble the, the letters to make new words, called an anagram. 
And what you can see is that when the students thought that Stanford was about being independent and was a place that you chart your own path, go your own way, we see the typical gap between continuing generation and first generation of students in the number of problems solved correctly. When you told students that Stanford was a place where you could be your interdependent self. You could see the, the red bar here at the, the interdependent side. They just did just as well, even better than the continuing generation students. So what you can see, they were, they were worried, they were nervous. This was a study that looks at cortisol. Cortisol spikes when you're stressed. And what you can see over here on the left-hand side is that the first generation students, when they heard about reading the letter about Stanford being a place where you go your own way, work by yourself, do all these things um, uh, by yourself, their cortisol spiked, they were stressed. When they were told that Stanford was a place that you could work with your peers, there would be other people like you, your family could come to Stanford, you didn't see that spike in cortisol. And it made no difference for the blue bars, the continuing generation. So Stanford was quite responsive to that. We showed them these kind of data. Um, in the last year, they formed a new office for first-generation students, which is a place that fosters activities for first-generation students where they can talk to um, other first-generation students. They form connections between graduate students and undergraduates, all who are coming from um, first-generation families. They've, um, uh, there are small amounts of funds to help students. There's, they, they, they were impressed by the, the data. Um, their new view book that just came out this year, um, it shows you that they weren't going to go all the way towards interdependence because Stanford and Freedom is, are together like this. And so there's a huge double page that talks about freedom. It's in the place, it's in the mission, it's in the people. So I mean, Stanford is not going to back off from <laughs> making an independent self. And, you know, for good reason. It's done a lot of good things in the world. But what they did do is add some other pages that really talk about Stanford as a community that comes together with a pursuit of excellence. There's lots of time for students to um, collaborate with one another in every area of life. So they added the idea that you could also be interdependent um, at Stanford, which I do think as we think about it is probably um, the answer in which of these cells. They're both good cells and probably the people that will thrive in the multicultural world will be people that will be aware of both their independent and interdependent selves and can figure out which self to, 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 to use when. And so in ending, I would just say that in case of conflict, I would say between these two ways of being, and I think this conflict is common, um, don't assume that the other person is bad or you know whatever word you would use for bad. Instead, think that you might be experiencing a culture class. And when you were aware that you were experiencing a culture clash, I think it's good to lead with interdependence. Interdependence is the more common way of being in the world. And you won't go wrong with leading with interdependence. If paying attention to relationships, paying attention to hierarchy, paying attention to um, how things are, are arranged and will typically help. When you lead with interdependence, what you should be doing is listening to what the other person is, is, is saying, what's important to the other person. When you're focusing on the relationship, that's typically a, a way to make uh, an interaction go well. If, of course, that doesn't work, then you can try independence. So this is sort of just an increase in the number of resources you have at, at, have at hand. And so at that, I will stop. I'd love to have um, questions, and I have here the work that I went through very briefly is the work of many, many people here, some of the collaborators, and, and it represents all of their hard work. And thank you to them, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, and Professor Marcus. This was stimulating, it was fun, it was fascinating to hear about all of these things, and, uh, and uh, it made me think about my own culture and whether I'd be uh, independent or interdependent. But please, let's open this up for questions. Yes. Uh, yes, I think so. That was great. I always love hearing about your work. Um, so I was just curious about the design of the study that measured interdependence and independence according
according to like showing them the letters, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how did you how did you find out whether they were first gen or continuing gen? Like how did you structure that? We, we knew that before they come in because we know that about the students. Oh, just students. from oh, so you were able to get that from the admissions office. Right. Right. Okay. And then how did you measure their cortisol? The cortisol is easy. That's a, a little swab, like a Q-tip from the cheek right here. So as they were leaving, you just swab it, their cheek. Right. As soon as they, as soon as they start to um, finish the test, you just you have just them. Right in there and like you tell it to them. <laughs> you, you know, you explain them and, and explain to them. And it's pretty common these days in psychology world to do that. And you can, um, you send it to a lab. You send it overnight. They analyze it like that. It's very, very easily done. Many studies like that are being done now. There's studies you can just take the smallest little drop of blood, put it on a piece of paper, send it to a lab, and get a whole array of um, stats about people's um, biology. So we're going to see more and more work like that. Thank you. Yes. With um, first generation going to university or college, not just Stanford. Um, did you notice anything different between members of the family, for example, the oldest, the middle child, the youngest child? Because I know in my family, four girls, we all went to colleges and universities, but we all chose very different paths. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you had studied that as part of the culture. I haven't studied it, how birth order and culture go together um, particularly, but I actually have studied birth order, and um, firstborns tend to be the high achievers in, in every family. Um, when you, at Stanford, um, nearly 70% of students are firstborns, for example. Um, that's who, and, and then, but it's also the case that in families, um, the firstborns are, usually takes the most responsible role. And then what's the, what the parents would want, what the parents would consider to be a good thing for the, um, their kid to do. And so then, siblings down the line have to find other paths to carve out their own niche. At least in the US where it's very important in middle class families to be somewhat unique or different. But it hasn't had a, um, a lot of focus at all. You know, what you need to do those studies are um, surveys of families, and it's hard to get everyone in the family to do the study. That's a great question. Because I have a sense that we could be somewhere in between, I, I, on I, the crossroad. I, I well, that would fit because as I, you know, as I started, certainly Italy fits in the West broadly. The West is much more independent than the rest of the the rest of the yes. world. But also, Europe is, I think, more towards interdependent interdependent side, and also Italy in particular. Mm -hmm. But also, I think, you know, only for some things and in all certain situations. situations. It seems yeah. to be almost a vocation for Italy to be somehow on the threshold <laughs> on culture. <laughs> yes. The yes. east and the west, right. and the north and the south, yes. the position in the Mediterranean. That's a great, it's a crossroads. Sort of. yes. It always has been. It's a yes. history, east and west coming together. You know, I, I feel the same. I really want to do those studies. I'm looking at Austin. I want him to do it. He's just like, I <laughs> I also have another question for you. Um, I was wondering, if you, uh, as you're studying this from an American perspective, if you think that there is uh, some change going on in the American in American culture, maybe towards evaluating more an interdependent model. And for example, the the emphasis that is being placed nowadays also in American academia on leadership. I'm wondering, the way leadership is presented is different from authority. And it is kind of a good mix of 
Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, I think you're right. In American business schools, there's a great deal of emphasis yes. on um, fostering good relations. Yes, so leadership leads by, by, by being interconnected. Right, right. And in fact, many of the studies show now that um, where there, that more interdependence is good for everybody, it's even good for the corporate bottom line. And in fact, there's been a few studies lately showing that the more women there are on boards and the more women CEOs, the better the company is doing. And the underlying reason seems to be women bring more of this concern for interdependence, more practice with um, fostering relationships, which are good for everybody. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you. you. Yes, Saul. Uh, thank you. Um, excellent talk. Thank you very much. And uh, I had a question for you regarding um, Maybe relating this topic to um, introversion and extroversion. I read a book recently by Susan Cain mm -hmm. titled yeah. "Quiet." Yeah, I know. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, how does that relate? <laughs> um, I think I think it's um, very um, related. She talks about the book is called "Quiet," and that would be an explanation for someone like he Jung at the beginning who wasn't talking. And sometimes people are quiet because culturally that's been their background that you don't talk until. Um, it's the situation calls for it in a lot of East Asian contexts. If you're going to ask a question, you have to look around and say, hmm, there's other senior people here, other older students, and they're not asking the question, so it probably, you know, why should I ask the question? I'm the younger person, and so let me just wait, and I'll wait until I understand it. So that's an explanation for quiet that comes from, for being quiet that comes from cultural background. Of course, there are personality differences among people. Some people are just less comfortable with talking and with expressing themselves. And so that's an individual difference for, for, for um, being relatively more quiet. People who are more extroverted can talk any, anytime, anywhere. So it's a, another factor. But a lot of the things that Susan Cain tried to argue about, which is that being quiet is actually a fine way to be in the world. Um, people who are quiet are, are observing, are taking things in. People who are quiet are listening. And, you know, we, you know, Americans tend to forget that we can't, we can't all be talking all the time. You know, so we're all talking, no one's listening. That's, that's not good. So, yeah, good question. Thank you. Oh, do I get to talk again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was um, uh, thinking a couple things. One, about how, so the question about do we save our, our spouse or our mother? I mean, if you you don't you haven't actually done a study like that. Have oh you? yeah, yeah. There's three okay, studies. Like, yeah. No, I would think. I would just to tell you, Professor Moya, that everything I tell you is based in rock solid published empirical data. I didn't tell you anything that's just off the top of my head. Okay. okay. Well, I guess the question I have then is like, you ask a bunch of Stanford students that, most of whom have never been married. Like, how can they? Experientially, even like enter into that. That's a good question, and, and, and that's a good thing to say. And in fact, the studies were done with people at different age levels, so it isn't because if students don't have a spouse, then of course they would save the mother. They don't even know the spouse, you're right. But I can tell you that. <laughs> but I can tell you there's some older people in this audience that <laughs> still save their mother. I can say <laughs> they were still saving their mother, yes. And so there's another thing about your book like that, which is that the question of like thinking and talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. So normally, since I'm American enough, you know, and uh, that, you know, certainly I can talk my way through something and think it through, no problem. But, like, trying to do Italian, I think, at, at the same time, <laughs> not happening. Exactly right. You do recognize there's this disconnect. I mean, I know many times we've practiced, and then you call it the spirits, and it's, uh, there's nothing there. Anything else? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you again. This was fascinating. And we can continue the conversation over a small reception in the room next door. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.